Hi everyone, I'm your host Bastian Nova and welcome to the second episode of my technology podcast. This week we are going to discuss a follow-up to a podcast episode that I made with some colleagues last year um, and it's topic was the smartphone market in transition because we had some stuff happening in uh, 2019 especially with uh, all those uh, sanctions between the US and China and um, the implications for Huawei who then had to remove the Google services from all their upcoming new smartphone releases um, triggering a new development of a new, let's say, ecosystem in the Android world with uh, Huawei starting their um, app gallery. And um, basically in this episode, I want to extend this discussion to the whole personal computing market. Um, for some of you, that terminology might be a bit irritating because uh, under personal computer, um, normally you understand your big fat machine standing on your desk or beneath your desk. But I am using this terminology here much, much wider, uh, incorporating basically all the devices that we all use all day today, uh, like our smartphones, tablets, even smartwatches, notebooks, and regular computers, of course. And um, in 2020, a lot has actually happened that is very foreshadowing um, for the years to come. And uh, in today's episode, I want to go through some of these topics with you and uh, explore um, what that actually might mean for the technology sector um, us as technology professionals and of course also consumers. So to start off the discussion um, I want to at first switch uh, to this screen which is basically uh, for, for everyone that is watching on YouTube um, I have to keep in mind that I'm not only doing this for YouTube, but also for in the uh, audio only format. Um, on the website uh, uh, for this program, uh, bianonet.com, you will find um, a article that includes the reference to that um, podcast episode from last year that uh, I did with my colleagues. And um, it got yeah, more into depth about how the whole smartphone market developed, uh, how it is to develop for the smartphone market. And um, then more or less in the end, we went into the discussion with the, with, with the implications for the, uh, for the smartphone market with the, uh, with the split off from Huawei from the regular Android ecosystem. Um, I want to put some remarks on that and um, in regards to a bit of hindsight now that we have w one additional year um, behind us. Uh, so the main problem, of course, for Huawei is that the majority of users outside of uh, China are heavily reliant uh, on Android services, uh, not on Android service, on Google services when they're using Android, sorry. And um, now that Huawei is not allowed to use those services anymore, they have to serve replacements. And the big problem was that, uh, of course, they need all the major brands to adopt their new system. And um, 
as one of uh, the major um, hypermarket brands in Germany where I'm currently working for, uh, we are of course got addressed by Huawei to bring our apps to their uh, to their store, and a lot of players here in Germany are still aren't on the on the app gallery. Um, not to speak of a lot of U.S. companies that are uh, also bind by the uh, by all the legal um, struggles between the U.S. and China right now. So, so for Huawei, that is a huge problem. Um, it is a huge challenge, um, which they are actually mastering somewhat. The devices that Huawei is re releasing are actually really, really good devices. Um, they're uh, really up there with uh, Samsung and Apple and uh, other flagship companies in the, in the smartphone world. But uh, yeah, sales have definitely declined um, outside of China um, because of the not um, availability of the uh, Google services. Uh, which normally every Android user gets more or less automatically plugged into. And um, so this is uh, still a developing story and it will be interesting to see how that situation continues to develop. Um, but that was basically one of the first signs that there is change coming in the personal compute computing business which actually leads us to our next topic and that is apple releasing their own silicon so their own processors going away from intel um, for everyone that is uh, Watching this on YouTube, this is an article here from um, 9, 9 to 5 Mac that I have open uh, on screen right now. And um, this is from the introduction in November. Uh, but the announcement, of course, was made that Apple is going to um, transition to its own processes was made in uh, mid last year at their worldwide developer conference. And that announcement was huge because it has a lot of implications. Of course, Intel, uh, due to that, is losing one of its major customers that they have been working with for, yeah, 16 plus years now. Um, the, um, I think the transition uh, from, from PowerPC to, um, Intel was announced back in 2005, first devices arriving in 2006. Um, so it's a long partnership and uh, it's now interesting to see uh, how this is developing. Um, definitely now that the M1 um, chips are out since November, uh, they have had a big splash in uh, uh, in the market already because um, the M1 is currently only available in Apple's um, entry level devices, and um, I'm currently running a M1 Mac Mini myself. Well, I'm recording this on at the moment, and. This system is actually outperforming my 2018 MacBook Pro uh, with double the amount of RAM and dedicated uh, GPU when I am editing 4K footage um, for from my um, F Fuji X-T3. And um, that's impressive for um, their first integrated uh, processor um, for for desktop. Of course, Apple is doing uh, processor development for their uh, iPhone and iPad lineup for years. And basically the M1 is a 
derivative of the um, A4 team more or less. But um, it will be really interesting to see what Apple comes up with uh, in, the, in the summer of this year. And um, there was also new, news lately that AMD is also working on an ARM-based processor and um, bringing the same high level of integration um, like the M1 does to for other manu manufacturers. And when you see that um, Apple is actually outperforming at the moment um, the Microsoft products that are based on Qualcomm chips uh, in a virtualized environment. Uh, I think that was a video that was made by Linus Tech Tips a few um, weeks ago. And that just shows what um, improvements can be made when you have uh, teams uh, in the same company working very closely together. And uh, that's, I think, a problem that a lot of um, technology companies have um, is that the one department does their th thing and the other department does their th thing and they are just not talking enough um, with each other. And um, that's something that really, that really shows uh, when, you, when you see the integration that Apple is doing with uh, Mac OS and the new ARM chips now. And it will be very interesting to see how this develops because I can foresee that in the long term that this development of going to ARM-based chips or let's say non-X86 based chips, uh, which are the you know, normal Intel and AMD processes are, um, will be the future because you can combine um, all-purpose cores that like uh, uh, for your day-to-day -day regular mundane tasks with highly optimized circuitry for image processing, audio processing, uh, machine learning, and what basically whatever you want to integrate. And um, we are actually going back to this discussion later in this episode um, because there's some ARM-related news that is, has implications on this um, that I want to address later in the episode. Next up is the current lawsuit between Epic Games and Apple, which is also a very interesting development. And actually, I want, initially wanted to um, record this episode on the same day I recorded the initial episode of the podcast. But uh, due to time constraints, I wasn't able to do that. And I'm actually glad that uh, that is the case, because... In, the, in this topic here, there have been some developments during the last week, which uh, I want to address um, here as well. So basically, uh, the root cause of this issue is that Epic Games doesn't want to pay um, the fees for the Apple um, App Store anymore, which is... Uh, 30% commission and they would rather have their own store uh, on iPhones and uh, uh, Apple devices uh, in general uh, and not pay those commissions to Apple or at least have a um, heavily reduced commission and of course uh, Apple is now fighting this uh, with everything they have and um, on the one hand, I have to say I understand the stance of Epic because as a company, you want to have 
uh, as much revenue as possible and reducing commissions that you have to pay to a third party heavily aids in that matter. And I can also understand Apple's stance because uh, the App Store revenue is a huge chunk of their of their income. And the other part is, in addition to those um, lawsuits and uh, antitrust complaints that are related to this Epic versus Apple um, situation at the moment, there are other antitrust lawsuits going on regarding uh, the App Store. Um, and, um, there was actually a few weeks back there was actually a uh, a notion in the uh, in one of the US states to force apple to open the platform to other stores uh, which uh, failed i can understand that opening the platform is a good thing of course uh, for for businesses um, to compete a bit differently on the iOS and iPadOS platform. But from the consumer perspective, I also have to say that uh, the situation for the platform would change dramatically at that moment. Because you can say whatever you want about the policies of the app store and so on but apple is ensuring through that that they have a very high quality of applications on the platform and, and a um, high level of security so there is a lot less slip ups where malicious software enters the ecosystem and yeah, the App Store guidelines, especially when you are a developer, when you go through the whole process, can be a real pain. And I am actually speaking from experience here. Um, but as an end user of the same platform, I have to say, um, I enjoy that level of security. Yeah, you have limitations, but... Um, for at least for me personally, that's a trade-off that I am uh, willing to take um, because for me, my phone or my 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 iPad, they are for me tools, and I'm relying on those tools, and I don't want to uh, mess around with virus scanners, and I don't know what what tools you have to use on Android devices these days. To have them clean and safe all the time and um, that protection would be massively weakened when once you allow third parties to have um, their own app stores uh, on the system because you're circumventing all those security measures um, by allowing that um, so this is a discussion that is very personal, but also very important for the whole industry because uh, the development this week actually was that Apple um, subpoenaed a lot of companies, including Valve Software, who's a um, operator of the Steam uh, platform, where, which is a platform where you can uh, buy and download games. Um, on also various platforms um, to share statistics and um, on different games. And then actually the, the judge in the Epic vs. Apple case uh, granted that. And uh, this is a huge um, thing for the market because uh, now it means in theory, all cards come on the table and uh, this can really, really have significant impact on a lot of services and products that we are using. Um, of course, as, uh, as a consumer, it's always good to have transparency and also to 
to perhaps also pay less because commissions are lower. Uh, I don't want to um, disagree here. But um, it will be interesting to see what happens with the market. And um, depending on, on what comes out of this lawsuit, I don't think that this will have um, purely positive outcomes for both businesses and consumers. Um, and there will be a lot a lot of change happening, um, not only for um, the whole iOS market situation, but also for other platforms. Um, this can have a huge impact um, for, yeah, for everyone. So getting to the next topic, which harkens back to the Apple M1, Apple Sil Silicon story. Um, because graphics card manufacturer NVIDIA uh, is in the process of buying um, ARM from SoftBank. And uh, this is a huge development because um, there, um, th there is a lot of discussion in the industry because, uh, on that and a lot of complaints have now be, no also be fi being filed by a lot of companies uh, I think Microsoft and several others um, are parties um, of these complaints because um, NVIDIA has in the past not shown to be a great competitive fair player and ARM has a model of licensing their technology to several parties. Um, like we discussed earlier, Apple is one player, AMD is one player, Qualcomm is one player, Huawei themselves is one player, Samsung is one player, and I don't know how many other companies. And... Um, depending on what NVIDIA does with ARM, um, that could have huge impact on those businesses and uh, their products in the future. Um, also for consumers, this could actually uh, mean that uh, when NVIDIA, for example, uh, says, okay, we double or triple or quadruple um, the prices for the licenses, that that part gets much more expensive or that um, NVIDIA doesn't allow the latest generation of technology uh, to go to third parties uh, but reserves those to themselves um, for one or two years so that everyone else is uh, um, not able to com compete with NVIDIA, um, which have also been um, using ARM, I, I think in the server space massively, and also um, in their Tegra line of uh, SOCs that are, for example, used in, uh, I think they're used in the Switch and the Nintendo Switch. And um, those implications can be huge for, yeah, all sectors of technology industry, uh, even even um, manufacturers of uh, solid state drives that you have in your uh, computer or your laptop um, can be affected because some are actually using ARM, ARM processors for the controllers on those um, solid state drives. And uh, it will be really interesting to see how this plays out. Um, there are not many well-developed alternatives uh, to the ARM process at the moment. The most promising alternative is the um, RISC-V system, which, uh, for example, Western Digital and Seagate uh, are already using for um, developing 
or I don't know if they already on the market re released um, controllers for uh, solid state drives that are already um, risk V based instead of ARM based. Um, and the risk V platform would allow manufacturers like Apple and AMD to uh, do the same that as with the ARM platform, but the risk V platform is actually uh, open source and um, those um, schematics um, for the different processors can be shared, uh, can be made public so that there can be a lot faster development of uh, new systems. But um, the uh, Risk Five uh, platform, as far as I know, is not that popular in the consumer space yet. So it, uh, we have to see how this is uh, going to play out. But um, with the, as I said earlier, industry moving more and more away from just pure general purpose. Um, processing units like your typical AMD or Intel processor and more towards um, integrated um, processing units like Apple's M1 or the Qualcomm um, CPUs and so on. Um, it will be interesting to see how this story develops. And to round the whole um, discussion up, we get to our last topic of today and that is a, is a general antitrust hearing that ha that has happened uh, in late 2020 uh, in the US and um, there are definitely also lawsuits currently in progress against Facebook and Google that are um, held by um, different um, states in the US um, to remediate some of the current issues that uh, that there are with uh, with those huge tech companies, and that there are problems uh, with those, especially due to the current worldwide crisis. I think that is not really disputable, and um, this can potentially change the landscape. Uh, of popular services in the next, yeah, I don't think months, but in the next few years, um, this will have huge impact um, because if this is all followed through, you will have um, a lot of split ups of, uh, of companies. Um, like for example, for Facebook, uh, there are calls to um, disconnect Instagram and WhatsApp from Facebook, um, then perhaps also Oculus again, um, so that uh, there is not as much data and uh, sharing and privacy violations uh, like they're happening at the moment. Um, I, we don't have to uh, go through all the scandals that have happened with, with Facebook, um, uh, Cambridge Analytics is one of them. So this is a development that we have to definitely follow. And um, also Epic um, has now filed an antitrust against Apple also in the EU. Um, the EU is also doing stuff in regards to Apple in regards to chargers. And uh, so there is a lot of regulatory stuff happening worldwide. So after now discussing all these several topics um, that I collected for today, I have to say that 2020 is the beginning or was the beginning of a major shift in the technology sector. Uh, all the consequences that this shift is triggering, we cannot even foresee today. And um, 
this will have consequences for consumers, businesses, developers, and um, it will trickle down even to the education and so on, uh, depending on what is all shifting. So we're only in 2021, and as you already heard, there have already been developments in the past two months that are quite massive already and uh, there is more to come this year and uh, I am actually looking forward to see how this um, transition of the of the market is going um, and I hope that th there will be a good middle road that uh, we are not just uh, killing off uh, the current market and uh, uh, having to restart with a lot of new companies uh, and uh, figuring refiguring out everything uh, but also let me know what you think about um, the situation um, do you have fears for certain outcomes in this situation or uh, do you have hopes um, for uh, for changes I really would like to have a discussion on, on this because this is a um, open topic with a lot of um, moving parts and uh, also let me know um, because I just dived into all these topics right away today uh, if you want to have more background on some of these topics, and, um, then I would dedicate some uh, episodes to diving in, in uh, deeper into those into those topics. So leave feedback on that, and um, I will look forward to the discussions that we will be having in either on the YouTube comments or on our website. So that's it for this week's episode. We will be back next week on Sunday at 8 p.m. Central European time with a premiere on YouTube and on 8.30 p.m. Central European time the new episode will hit your favorite podcast services. The show notes with all the links uh, of today's episode you can find on uh, bnonet.com or uh, in the description of this episode on your podcast. Thank you very much for listening and goodbye. <laughs>